For the past year and a half, maybe maybe more, um, as you know, we as a church family have been undergoing some serious transitions as a faith family. We have been transitioning and, and changing from what was in years past and probably normal for a lot of churches, operating as primarily a large group gathering for our church services, right? We met as a large group gathering, and that is how we did ministry. That's how we did discipleship mainly. That's how we um, did our different ministries and had a major overhaul to where now the primary way that we do church service, the primary way way we do discipleship ministry is through the small groups we call the gatherings, right? That happen on Sundays and on all different kinds of small groups throughout the week. So that is now the primary way that we are made up and and do ministry, do discipleship, and even church service um, through the week. This, I believe, of course, the pandemic had a factor in this, but it, it is what I believe God has been using to ready the church worldwide and in, in some ways shaken us up, right, to, to shed off things that have probably are going to be a hindrance and an obstacle for us in the things that he has prepared in this final time and chapter of, of church history, of human history, to be probably more accurate. Um, it, it gives me the picture of, of when David, when he was a young boy, and he was going to go get food and deliver food for his brothers and saw Goliath insulting God's people and, and God. And so David decided to go and, and fight Goliath. And, of course, he was encouraged not to do that. But eventually Saul said, okay, if that's, if that's what God has put on your heart to do, go, go do it. And, but let me put on your, my armor on you so you can have some protection. Well, that armor was way too big for, for little David. It was ill-fitting for him. It, it would get in the way for him to actually do what God has called him to do, which was an, pretty much of an impossible task, right? A boy to kill a giant. And so he had to say no to that ill-fitting exterior. He had to shed it off and pick up the things that God has given to him that he knew he was to use the, the, the five smooth stones and his, and his sling. And that is what God used to, to yeah, finally deliver that blow and do the, the impossible. But it, that wasn't the actual thing that killed the giant, was it? It was David's complete trust in God. Jesus plus nothing. It was, it was God it was his everything. That whatever stood before him what was maybe great, but God was greater. Whatever seemed to be the Goliath of our, of our life right now, of what is before us, God, I believe, is, is forming us, shaping us, so that we can shed off the things that are ill-fitting as, as a church and as, as, a, as a body to be able to put our complete dependency upon him to do what he is calling us to do. And you know what he is calling us to do. That is to take the message of the gospel, what Jesus did for us, the saving message, and bring it to people of all the nations. So what Jesus commanded us to do is to go and make disciples of all the nations. And, and I believe this is what the shakeup in, in the church is all about, that we are to start to shed off the ill-fitting exteriors that we may have that will get in the way of us especially trusting God completely, to do the task and the call that he has, he has given to us as a church to do. And so not only, I believe, is, is as we get smaller in these ways, um, going to make us more adaptable and flexible to, to be ready to do what God is calling us to do, to be that church on the move that we talked about earlier in this, in this year, but that he's also bringing and facilitating this time so that every cell in the body of Jesus Christ becomes healthy and becomes strong, right? And, and that's really important, that, that 
God wants every cell, every member of the body to be healthy and strong. Because as we talked about, it is these cells, it's these parts that make up the body of Jesus Christ. And its level and degree of healthiness and life and what life is there or not there is also the degree where a faith family like ourselves has life, has that centeredness on Christ, has that trust in Jesus, and therefore living by the Spirit or not. Yeah? And, and so this, this sermon series is really taking what God has been doing and, and helping us take us as our individual cells, if you will, individual parts, so that all of us in our homes, in our households, in our families, become healthy, life-giving, centering our whole lives on, on Jesus, just as David's whole life was about who God is and not about the world around him. That's why he was called a man after God's own heart, that that would be every single member, every single home, every single family. So today's message is entitled, Walk Worthy of the Calling. Walk Worthy of the Calling. And, and we'll be looking at a, a few passages in the, in the book of Ephesians, specifically in chapter 5 and chapter 6. Not the whole chapters, but parts of it. Um, to, to help us get on a very practical level. Because if you remember last week, we talked about the question, why do we have kids, right? Why do we have children? And we'll look to God's word to help us understand that vision that God has for us of why he has given us marriage and then children. And that in, in some is to raise up generations of faithfulness. Faithfulness across the generations. Yeah? And that each family, as we live and, and breathe and have our being in God, it is to actually represent, display in this unbelieving world the message of the gospel, the message of reconciliation here in this world. We, we talked about that, right? That, that, that's what families are, are to be doing. And that's what the picture is supposed to be. So that's, that's the vision that God has for us as, as households, as, as families. But here in the book of Ephesians, we're going to actually get to the nitty-gritty, as they say, to the details, to the practical instructions of what that actually looks like. So that's the vision, but then how are we to walk that out in our families? Yeah. So that picture is actually seen. It's not just a, a vision that's out there, but that is actually something we walk out in our homes. So it gets really, really practical. But let me first kind of go over the book of Ephesians really in a, in a, in a summary because I believe it's going to be helpful for us as we get into the context of these verses. This is Paul's letter to the Ephesian, Ephesians church. Um, if you read Acts 19, you'll understand how Paul got to um, Ephesus, this, this big city where it was kind of an epicenter of pagan worship where they worship Greek gods and Roman gods. And, and Paul went to Ephesus, and, and the, uh, excuse me, Acts chapter 19 says that God performed extraordinary miracles through the hands of Paul. Yeah? And this is, this is the situation, if you're familiar with Acts, this is the time, this is the place where even his handkerchiefs and his aprons were, that were from his body were taken to people who were sick and they were healed. Those who were possessed by demons and those evil spirits went simply by bringing those things that Paul had, right? That, that's the extraordinary miracles that the people of Ephesus experienced and witnessed. And, and, and so powerful was the Spirit of God moving in this city that those who were worshiping these pagan gods and involved in occult practices brought their books of magic, right? And they publicly burned them in front of all of the community, saying to everyone around them that I have given my life to Jesus Christ to be my Savior and my Lord. It was amazing what was happening in this city. And so there was 
faithful followers that were growing out of the city that once was completely begging, but now full of dedicated, faithful followers of Jesus Christ. So Paul spent about a couple of his years there and then had, had left, and then a few years later he was imprisoned by Rome. And he writes this letter to the Ephesians church, the church in Ephesus, from prison. And, and the, there's two parts of the, uh, the book of Ephesians, this letter, and, and, and they're very distinct. They're very different. It's almost exactly in half. The first three chapters are about Paul expounding on the story of the gospel, not as just a story that's out there, but a story that's so interwoven and intricately involved with our life. He, he, he shares that, yes, we, we were once dead in our trespasses and sins. All we cared about was ourselves. We were lost in sin. We, all we wanted to do was live by the lust of our passions. But God, in his rich mercy, in his great love, he saved us. And he made us alive. We were once dead, but he made us alive with Jesus Christ. And he joined our life with his resurrected life. Yeah? And this was a plan. This was a plan that God had already had in his heart even before the foundations of the earth. That his plan was to do this all along. It was bigger than just you. It was just bigger than just me. It was just bigger than even just what we're seeing here in, in Ephesus around you. This was a plan of bringing the entire families of the world into one huge family under Jesus Christ. It started with this guy named Abraham that he, would, he gave a promise to, to bless all the families of the earth. And that's what we're seeing here right now because at one time you were excluded from this family of faith, this covenant people. But now you are included into it because of Christ Jesus. And now he is bringing together a, a family, multi-ethnic family of God under Jesus Christ. This is what God had planned all along, and this is what is happening. Yeah, And so that's what is witnessing. Paul from prison, he's saying, even though I'm in prison, I am thanking God that I am getting to witness this right now, that God's family is growing bigger and bigger and bigger. This is the story of the gospel that I pray, Paul says, that you just not only know, but that you experience its power. You experience its power, the power of the gospel. So he prays for the, for the Ephesians church in this, that they will know the love of God in such a deep way where their roots grow deep into his love and they are filled with his life. They're, 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 they're moved by the power of the Spirit. And so that's the first half of the book of Ephesians. And so he's telling them about this, the story of the gospel, that their lives are so intricately in, in, weaved into. But then he says, I don't want you just now to understand it. I want you now to respond to it. I want you to now conform to it. I want the gospel of the, of the, of the Lord Jesus Christ that you know of, that, you, that saved you, that brought you alive, and that you live by resurrection power, that saved you, that wiped away every sin, no matter how horrible it is, that same gospel. Now I want to challenge you. I want to, to call you for it to shape every aspect of your life your heart, your family life, your neighborhood, your community, your church, everything. And that's from chapter 3 onward. And that's where we read here in chapter 4 our Bible quote for today. It reads this, Ephesians chapter 4. Therefore I, the prisoner in the Lord, urge you to walk worthy of the calling you have received. I'll read the next couple of verses here because it, it just ties in really well. With all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, making every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. We'll see this theme again and again, but Paul from here in chapter 4 onward is calling them, urging them to walk worthy of of the calling that we have received.
I believe that is such a necessary encouragement and urge that we as a, as a body of believers need to hear. That we walk worthy of this calling that we've received. Not as a duty, not as an obligation, not as rules, but because of what Jesus Christ has done for us, we walk worthy of that. We walk in a manner that is worthy of the calling that we received in Jesus Christ. And so like I said, he's, he's, he's going to go into, and you can read these things on your own. We're going to take a, more of a laser focus. He talks about what that looks like in the church, right? And, and then specifically what that even looks like in families. And what the, how a, a Christ-centered, gospel-shaped family is to look like. And, and so these are instructions to husbands, wives, children, families, households of what to do so that we are able to be this picture of the gospel in this world. Yeah? And at the heart of this, at the heart of this is this spirit of humility, this, this heart of submission that we put ourselves underneath one another this is all across the board, church, in our families. And by doing so, we do that unto the Lord. And so really, this is a really core part of all the theme that's running through what Paul instructs us as, as families to do. Because by doing so, there's a divine purpose that's being accomplished. So we're going to go through each one of these parts in Ephesians 5. We're going to start in verse 21. And, and, and firstly, address spouses, husbands and and fathers, excuse me, husbands and wives. Um, Spouses, the first point, live out the gospel story in your marriage. That's the first point for us this morning. Spouses, live out the gospel story in your marriage. Starting verse 21 of chapter 5 in Ephesians, and further submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. So this is the heart of it. This is going to run right through. For wives, This means submit to your husbands as to the Lord. For a husband is the head of his wife as Christ is the head of the church. He is the savior of his body, the church. Verse 24, as a church submits to Christ, so you wives should submit to your husbands in everything. For husbands, this means love your wives just as Christ loved the church. He gave up his life for her. I'm going to skip to verse 33. You can read the rest of the chapter if you like. It's, it brings it all together, but in verse 33 says, so again, I say, each man must love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. What you see here in chapter 5 of Ephesians is Paul helping marriages, spouses see that their life purpose, that their purpose of their marriage is to enact the story of the gospel through their relationship. To, to show to one another, but firstly, and then really ultimately to the world around them, the redeeming story and love relationship that we have with Jesus Christ. That everything that's happening between a husband and wife is not about simply the husband and wife. It is about something grander and bigger than that. It is actually demonstrating, living out the gospel of Jesus Christ. And his love relationship that we have as a church together with him. This is huge. Okay, That as a marriage, this is the reason we do this. So for the wives, they take on the the role of the church. And as the church reveres Jesus Christ, puts ourselves under his authority, that he is our Savior, that he is the uh, uh, the Lord of our life, that is what we are doing in our marriage. As to the Lord, wives, do submit to your husbands as to the Lord, right? That is what's happening here. And husbands taking the very role of Christ Jesus. And that is 
a responsibility. Whew. If you talk about walk worthy of the calling that you received, husbands, our calling is to take on the role of who Jesus is and how he has interacted, interrelated, served, loved his people, his church. That is how we are to also love our wives. This, this interaction, this vision, this reason, this divine purpose, this thing beyond ourselves is the purpose of what our marriages are all about. Yes, there's needs. Yes, there's arguments. Yes, there's going to be difficulties and challenges. But through all of that, what we are doing is wives submitting to husbands as to the Lord, husbands loving our wives like Jesus loved the church and gave his life up for her. Here's the difficulty, and this is the place I think a lot of Christians still even perhaps struggle with in these truths, is that the world's philosophy has so infiltrated our thinking, our psychology, and even our, our way of living that we, we don't realize that those are things that means that we've been, those are the things that we were dead in. Those are things we're dead in, and we have a new way of living. In fact, Ephesians, Paul says, we need to put off our old self and put on our new self, right? And, and some of us still haven't taken off those things. And in this world, this is what the world's philosophy, ideology, teaches us about marriage. It is about, again, doing your part and doing my part. And as long as you do your part, then I will do my part, but the moment you forget to do your part, you choose not to do your part, I'm not going to do my part either. We call that a 50-50 marriage, right? I make up 50%, you make 50 up 50%, and then whatever our parts are, that makes up 100%. It is, it is a contract, right? We talk about this in growth track, the difference between a contract and a covenant. A contract is simply going to be an agreement that if one party breaks that agreement... It's all over. That's a contract. What we're living out here is not a contract. It is a covenant relationship. It is a covenant relationship that's not just even between husband and wife. That's, that's, that's for sure. But the covenant relationship is united in Jesus Christ. It is a covenant relationship of Christ Jesus with us as a church. And so in this worldly philosophy, in these old clothes that we wear of the world, it, it's very merit-based. Everything in the world is merit-based. It's work-based, okay? This part of the world's ideology of what marriage is is so merit-based to where, yeah, I will, I will give him respect the moment he deserves respect. <laughs> yeah, I will love her once she starts to become lovable. You understand what I'm saying? It is so based on merit the moment we're not, so always the excuse, always the basis is I'm not going to do certain things or I'm not, I don't feel like doing those things because they're not doing a certain thing. Do you see how that's contract based? Do you see how that's merit based? But Paul tells us we have been saved by grace through faith, not by works so that any man could boast. Right? And that, our lives, to be shaped by the gospel is not merit-based. It is grace-based. It is based on the very thing that God has done for us where the death of Jesus has covered a multitude of sins. No matter our background, no matter our past, no matter the greatest of sins, no matter what it is, it covers it all. And not only that, he's made us alive with Jesus, given us the same power of the resurrection for us to live and be empowered by and a new identity that is no longer of the flesh but by the spirit of the living God. So when we look at each other and we struggle in this whole thing, it's not fair. <laughs> 
It's undeserving. They haven't merited it. That's where we have to put off our old clothes and put on Christ. And what we're doing here is, is as husbands, when we love our wives as Christ loved the church, we are doing exactly that. We are giving up our lives for her. Putting down our own agenda, putting down our own life, our own needs. It's not saying in a macho way, yeah, I'll give up my life for her. You know, I'll, 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 I'll die for her. It's not about dying for her. It's about living unto Christ and loving your wives as Christ loves the church. Oh, that, that's, that takes more. <laughs> so what's that picture look like? I, I, saw, I heard that verse, Pastor. I, I, I'm very familiar with it, but what does that look like? I'll tell you what that looks like. Remember when um, there's that time and, and Jesus, there, uh, a bunch of people brought in an adulterous woman pretty much half naked, caught her in the middle of adultery in the, in the act, and brought her to shame her, right, in front of Jesus and said, teacher, according to Moses, for her act and what she did is we're to stone her. What do you say? And they did this because they wanted to trap Jesus, use something that he said against him. They were trying to create a dilemma. And you know what he said? He said, let the person who's never sinned for, throw the first stone. And one by one, they dropped the stones, and they all left. You know what he said to the woman? He said, does nobody condemn you? She lifts up her face, looks around, and she says, no one, sir. And he says, neither do I. Go sin no more. That's how Jesus loved. Jesus knew the law, but he knows that the law condemns, but he demonstrated grace. Remember that time when Jesus was with his disciples very close to his, his crucifixion time, and there must not have been a, a boy to be able to be there or a servant there to wash their feet. So what Jesus did was he took off his clothes, put a towel around his waist, got down on his knees, and he started washing his disciples' feet. They couldn't believe it. Peter wouldn't let him do it, and he was really confused. But in the end, he said, the way I'm washing your feet, the way I'm serving you, I'm doing this to show you this is the way I want you to serve others. This is the way I want you to love other people. One another, but others as well. That's how we're to love our wives. That's how we're to love our wives. On the, on the day of his crucifixion, the day that he was going to be given over to the authorities to, to be judged and to experience something that no human being has ever experienced nor could ever experience. The day where he would become sin, he who had no sin become sin and, and die an excruciating death. It was not just a physical death. It was not just a physical pain. It was to experience spiritual death, the actual reality of death itself. For us, on that day, knowing exactly what was coming, this is Jesus' words. He said, Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me. Yet not my will, but yours be done. Husbands, you getting a picture here of how we're to love our wives? This is how Jesus loved the church. This is how Jesus loved us. Father, this is too hard for me. This is too painful for me. This is too much for me. I don't think I can handle it. If, if you can't, please take it away. But 
not my will, but yours be done. That's supposed to be how we love our wives. That's how Jesus loved the church. We do this not because our wives deserve it or don't deserve it. We do this because this is how we walk worthy of the calling that we have received. Wives, whether your husband deserves respect or not, that is not the case. You are not to live in the old clothes and the old ways of being merit-based, of hidden deserving or not. You do it because you walk worthy of the calling that you receive to be taking the place in this world, on this earth, as the church submitting under Jesus Christ and showing what that means to your husband. And not making that conditional, but making that completely a living out and demonstration of the gospel that you have been saved by. Do you see how if Christian couples choose to live in this way, regardless and not go 50-50, but you do this because it is our divine purpose, how that can not only bless the marriage and the family, but also people around who are witnessing this? I know I have. Perhaps you have as well, but this is what we're called to. It's bigger than us. It's bigger than our marriage. Everything in our life is about Jesus Christ and making his name known, including your marriage. And so, whether you're a wife, whether you're a husband, whether you're to be that, that is God's word for us. And here's the beautiful thing. By doing so, we get to put ourselves, I guess, I don't know, I'm struggling for the words here, but there's, there's a curse that came with sin in this world on marriages that we are going to be completely free from and experience the blessing that God has meant for marriage to be as we walk worthy of this calling, as we put into practice what God is calling us to do in this. Because if you remember back in Genesis, here's the curse that came because of our sin, because of sin of man. In Genesis 3.16, it says to the woman, God says, I will sharpen the pain of your pregnancy and the pain you will give birth and you will desire to control your husband, and, but he will rule over you. Wow. What, do, you, do you see the issue there? The desire for the wife is for her husband, but it's the implication of that desire is to control him, to manipulate him, to do things in a way so that she gets what she needs from him because no longer do they look to God for life, love, security, acceptance anymore, but to one another, but she controls him. But here's the thing. He dominates her. He rules over her. He exerts his strength over her. That's called what we call in English a power struggle. And that is the curse. In marriage, we experience this power struggle. Even in Christian marriages, you can experience the, the curse that came of sin in your relationship if you do not put that off and put this on. But if you do, Oh, the blessings that God has, has prepared for you. That's not just for yourself, because it is a sacrificial love. It is a, 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 a desire to do something that's greater than just for your own needs and your own purposes. When, when you do that, the blessings of the freedom from this curse and also the, the fruitfulness that he wants to bring into your family is truly only explained and described through the words of, of Scripture. It is freedom. So submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. It's the heart of how we live out the gospel in our family life. And, and I want to say this. These verses are not, they don't say this. Wives, get your husbands. Yeah. Wives, get your husbands to love you like 
Christ loves the church. Husbands, get your wives to respect you, right? Like he respects his own body. You know how he feeds his own body, loves his own body, and he takes care of himself? Get him to love you like that. It doesn't say that, does it? <laughs> this, these, these verses are not for the other person. They're for you as a husband, me as a husband, you as your wives. And same here with the children. This is important to understand. In Galatians 6, 5, it says, for we are each responsible for our own conduct. That's the focus here, okay? So these aren't verses that we use ammunition for each other. These, these are addressed to us. And so the same thing applies for our children when we read this next Verse here that's directed to children. So second point, children, obey and honor your parents in the Lord. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Everywhere in the world, in all societies, they're going to agree that children, it's good, it's right for children to obey their parents. You don't need to be a Christian to agree with that, right? People of all of the world will say, yeah, that's... Makes sense. That's how it's supposed to be. If a society disagrees with that, that society is in big trouble. Okay? Because this brand new human being that comes into the world knows nothing about the world, knows nothing about right and wrong. All they know of is what's good for me. That's how babies are born. They're born egocentric. Me, 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 me. Unless we teach them otherwise, it's going to be me, 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 me. And it makes them miserable for everyone around them, especially as they get older. And if they're an adult who still thinks that, that's going to make up for not just a terrible relationship, but if a society believes that, that's what society is going to turn into. And it's going to be all chaos. Okay? And so this is a natural law. It's how it's supposed to be. It's helping kids understand that submitting to authority is right and good. For us as Christian parents, we're teaching our kids about authority, that, that it's good. In fact, right now in the world, I don't know, especially in the Western world, I would say, our kids are being taught that authorities are bad, they're not to be trusted, they're, they're horrible, we need to get away from under them. That, that's not what the Bible teaches us to teach our kids, <laughs> Okay? The Bible tells us that God has established every single authority. Every single authority that God, every person is to be subject to the governing authorities for there is no authority except from God. And those which exist are established by God, Romans 13. When we teach our children to obey us and to submit under us, we're teaching them how to submit and obey God. Okay? If children do not learn how to obey authority, they will struggle to obey any authority, especially the ultimate authority, that is God. They will learn how to obey one authority, and that is their own. And that is exactly what the enemy is, has an agenda to infiltrate in every home. Okay? And so... Authorities from God. That's what we want to teach our children by teaching them loving obedience, not forceful, yeah, obligatory obedience, but teaching them loving obedience and that, that authority is good. In fact, here's a family activity for everybody, anyone who's been listening on into this series. We talked about last week how it's important that our time and our routine and our daily life reflect the things that are important to us that we're trying to teach. It's not just simply on a Sunday that church is important, but we don't do anything throughout the week that shows that our relationship with God is important and that we're not teaching them about the things of God, right? So we talked about how one really practical thing we can do is bring a family night. You can do it weekly, every other week, or just something intentional that you can do. And so here's an idea for you just to help you, and you can, don't have to do this, but it's on our website on the sermon no post for today that you can see it's a family night activity. Today we don't have a video, but just a PDF. And it's an activity that's really created that teaches kids about the importance of submitting to authority, why it's good, why it's important, right? And you can do that together, and it's fun. It's silly. It, it, it engages the kids together. And you can do this, I would say, 
for you know elementary school to preteens. Um, it's kind of helping you understand how to do these things as a family together and, and, and have some fun. It's being brought to, there's a great resource from itstartsathome.org. Check it out. I just have really appreciated some of the practical things it brought, and that's what this resource is from. So that's what you can do this week or, or schedule it together as a family. Really, really great about teaching children about submitting to authority. And the second thing that we see here in Ephesians chapter 6, and they're going to verse 2, is that now not just a natural law, but a divine law that God gives. And that is to honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a purpose, verse 3, so that it may turn out well for you and that you may live long on earth. Okay? So this is the commandment that God has given, that he divinely has given directly to his people to honor his, our father and mother, and it's a promise I mean, a commandment with a promise, and that promise leads to a blessed and long life. Now, the Greek verb for honor, okay, is, means to value, to esteem, to re- highly regard that person. That's what honor means. So, honor means more than simply just following the rules, <laughs> Just obeying the and being compliant to the rules. Honor really means valuing your parent. And here's the kicker. This is not just for your kids and your children. This applies for us as adult children for our parents as well. Remember last week we talked about the 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 vision for God's as families is intergener I mean uh, uh, generations of faithfulness, but that happens intergenerationally. Across the generations, right? And and so honoring our parents, we don't obey as adult children. We don't obey. We're not commanded to, uh, we're not instructed to obey our parents because, of course, we've we've left our mothers and fathers and we cleave to our uh, our husbands and wives. So we we don't obey as children, but we honor them. Now, here's where it relates to what we just talked about. This is not (laughs) merit-based either. We don't honor our parents only if they're honorable. It's easy to honor those who are honorable. But pastor, what if my, my parents are really dishonorable? They've actually done pretty horrendous things. I, I know. I've heard the stories. I've worked with people whose parents have done dishonorable, if not despicable things. What about in those situations? Does this apply? Yes, it does. It means to value your parents as God values them. It means to esteem them as God has commanded us to esteem him. This is not about just you and your relationship with your parent. This is about you and your relationship with God. And here, why this is so important is if you don't honor your parents and you dishonor them in front of your kids, Guess what you're teaching them as they get older? Would you like your children to honor you even if you may not be the most honorable of people in your old age? If you're wanting to teach your children what it means to honor your parents in the Lord, you honor your parents in the Lord. Kind of gives a different perspective to this promise that so that it may turn out well for you and that you may live long on earth, right? (laughs) Well, that is a command that has a promise to it. And it brings intergenerational faithfulness. It brings the generations together in where we are doing what God has called us to do for him. And it's based on the grace that we have received. The story of the gospel that we are to be shaped by and to live out. Even with our relationship with our parents. Now that doesn't mean, I I I can do a whole series on this. It doesn't mean trusting them. It doesn't mean, you know, entering to things that will be harmful for your family. But there's a way to value your parents and honor them. That's going to be what God is calling you to do, right? That's about his grace 
and his richness of mercy and his, and his goodness and what he has done. I don't have the strength to do that. I don't think I can do that. Well, you can't. That's the truth. You can't. That's why Paul in Ephesians told him, I pray that you understand this un- incomparable great power that is available to you, to us who believe. It's the same power that raised Jesus Christ. This is the same power you're, that I have given you to live out this calling that you are to walk out in your lives for the sake of my name. That, that's where it comes from. That's, that's where it's all going. So parents, value your parents, your own parents in front of your children, but also through your children as well. Here's another practical um, example. Maybe something, an idea that you can take. And, and that's to have your children, the next time your, your parents or your, their grandparents visit, have them prepare some interview questions for your, for your parents or their grandparents, right? Just, you know, children love to ask questions. You know that? They, they come up with the most interesting of questions. Have them prepare some interview questions. Things like, you know, what... what you know, what did you learn about Mary? What did you, what's the biggest lesson you've learned in life? What did you learn about God? You know, what's the most embarrassing thing that's ever happened to you? I don't know. Just come up with, have them come up with things and then set up that time for your kids to interview their grandparents and learn from them. Wow, the message in that is powerful. Maybe even record it on video. That's, that's what we're talking about, valuing. And if they're Christians... And they've been faithful Christians. Oh, man, what you're doing is just bringing richness of, of God's wisdom into the next generation that there's no way that you could provide. It's that intergenerational faithfulness that's coming. So that's an idea. Honoring your parents in the Lord. All right, lastly, parents. Here's a theme For the next verses, for parents, parents emotionally nourish and spiritually train your children. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 4. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Okay? So, it says fathers here, but this does include mothers as well. Do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Uh, trying to struggle with where I want to start on this. So the, the, the gospel, or excuse me, the New Testament was written in the, the, the language of Greek, right? And Greek is known to be a very precision language. It, it helps with the nuances of different words and different meanings, and that's why philosophies came, came really out of, out of the Greek language. And, and so the word anger is used in different ways throughout the throughout Scripture, especially in the New Testament. And here, this word anger is very important to understand. It it means fathers do not, mothers, do not provoke your children to seething anger. Okay? It's it's an anger that is, it it goes into hiding. The illustration I read is like a, a, a sap swelling inside of a tree on a very hot day. It's a an anger that goes beneath the surface of the soul and it's just bubbling underneath there in resentment and hostility. Parents, don't provoke your children to this kind of seething anger. That's, that's the instruction here, right? To put this in a little bit more of context, another anger that is described is in Galatians 5.20 where it talks about the works of the flesh. Right? That anger is, is translated in English as outbursts of anger or fits of rage. That's that anger that just explodes usually because it comes out of the flesh. Flesh being you're trying in your own effort to get your own needs met of love, acceptance, worth, and security. And when those don't get met, when the things of this world promise falsely to deliver on those, but it doesn't deliver and you get disappointed, it leads to this, it can lead to this kind of outburst of anger. A fit of rage, okay? So that's that kind of anger. Another anger that we've seen is also in the book of Ephesians in chapter 4. You're familiar with this. It says, be angry, 
but do not sin. This anger is a totally different Greek word, and that anger basically is probably the purest kind of anger. It's very likened to the very anger that God expresses that's neither good or bad. It's just signaling something that's happening inside of you that has that either has been threatened or something important that's been um, hurt, right? So, for example, if young man over here, his, he has a really nice guitar. I all, I've talked about his guitar before. If, I'm not saying this is the most important thing for young men, but if it is a very important thing for him and somebody accidentally scratches it up and he gets angry about it, which would never happen, right, young man? Never, and, and that would never happen. But if it, if it does, that might say that that guitar is important to him, right? But Ephesians 4 is telling us not, it's not the anger that's the emphasis, it's how you hang, handle that anger, right? If you love God's word and God's word is really important to you, and if somebody misuses it and misleads people using God's word, and you, that should anger you. But that's neither, that's not, that could be a good anger, Right? But the, again, the emphasis is not on the anger itself here in Ephesians 4. It's on how you handle it, whether you let it become sin or not. So let's read that in context here. Ephesians 4, 25 to 26. Therefore, having put away falsehood, let each one of you speak truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger. Okay, some key Pieces here. Put away falsehood. Instead, speak truth with one another. Yeah? When we're angry, don't sin and don't let the sun go down on your anger. Okay? So gospel-shaped lives and relationships, here's what we do. We put away falsehood, meaning we don't present to one another things that are not, not true. That's how, that's how we're, we don't present to one another things that are not true. Instead, we speak truth to each other. Right? We speak truth to each other. And, and when we are angry, we continue to talk to each other. We, we, we deal with it. We don't hold on to it. We don't let it go into hiding. We don't let the sun go down on it. It simply means this. When you're angry, even, even if it's good anger, you got to deal with it. You can't just nurse it. Oh, anger, anger. And let it grow and grow because it turns bad. You got to deal with it. You got to talk about it. Don't present to each other something that's false. Speak truthfully to one another. So, in the same way, we as parents, we cannot provoke our children to anger in a way that they cannot express the anger or in ways that we put rules upon them and we do ask them to do things that, that it just goes underneath. We cannot do things to where their anger goes into hiding or goes underneath the surface and they're not able to express it. And I know this is different culturally to culturally. That's why I love God's word is it, does, it just goes across cultures. It, it, doesn't, it transcends cultures to where we build a culture of the church and not a culture that's, uh, we don't try to build church in, 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 in some kind of alignment to the culture. Does that make sense? That God's word is helping every culture Western, Eastern, Northern, Southern, it doesn't matter, to his word. How do we do that as parents sometimes? Sometimes with parents, we don't, we don't allow our kids to express anger. <laughs> when they get angry, we shut them down. And we almost give them the message that God doesn't like anger. And that's wrong. You know what is happening? It becomes a suppressed anger. It becomes a seething anger. It goes internal, and it's going to come out. We, we have to help them talk about it, express it, and kids will not express it appropriately. They will stamp their feet. They will throw things. They will yell. They will do all those things. That's where the next part of the verse comes in. Bring them up in discipline and instruction. That word bring them up is also in the Greek. It means to nourish and to feed, to provide for. Fathers, I want to speak to you for a second because moms tend to do this better than fathers. So maybe all parents listen to this, but especially fathers. You are not just a physical provider of your home and to your children. You also must be an emotional provider 
to your children. Okay? It's not just physical provide. You're not providing, you go and you go do the work and you bring the home the, the, the money. We call it bacon. I don't know why we call it bacon, but you bring home the money and then that's good. Every, your job is done. Your job is not done. That is not the calling that you have been called to to walk worthy in the manner of. So nourish your children. Bring them up means to, to nourish them. To provide for them. It's very similar. It's a, it's a parallel verse to Psalms 23 where the, it's about uh, God is our shepherd, that we shall not be in want, right? He, he makes us lie down in, in green pastures and he leads us beside quiet waters. And in the dynamic version of the interpretation is that he nourishes us by leading us to these, to these pastures and to these waters. That's the leadership. It's a shepherding. It's a shepherding of your child's heart. That is the instruction for us as parents to have, that we are to emotionally nourish them. Um, I'm not, how can I do that if I'm not good at that? Good question. Very good question. You have a father in heaven who's there to parent you that you need to do that with first. You need to. If you have trouble, you got seething anger, if you got suppressed anger, if you got emotions that you don't know how to talk about, deal with, go to your father. Let him father you. Express him. Talk about him. Learn from him and how he does that with you. And then I guarantee you, you will learn something that you cannot get from any book anywhere. I know because I've read most of those books. And those things don't offer anything to what God can offer to you as your father. So if those are things that you have trouble in, great, be honest about it, acknowledge it, but then go to your father and start to learn how to do those things because then that's how you do those things for your children. Does that make sense? Because how can one who's not disciplined discipline others? If we're not disciplined, you can't discipline. You, you got you to gotta have this in you, and that comes from your relationship with your father. There's a, a person I used to listen to quite a lot when I was a kid and um, really still respect quite a lot. His name is Dr. James Dobson. Some of you may have heard him. He's well known for this quote, this phrase. And he said, rules without relationship lead to rebellion. And I, I believe this is really what this, this sums up, that you know, parents do not provoke your children to seething anger. Instead, bring them up nourishing in a nourishing, gentle way, in, in these loving ways, in discipline and instruction. Rules without relationship lead to rebellion. But the same thing, the reverse is also true. Relationship only without rules also lead to rebellion. If you just flip-flop that and you, you grew up in a home where it's so strict and you're like, oh, my home, we're not going to have any rules. I'm going to be my kid's best friend or let them do and just let them kind of live it out and figure it out. If they do not have this other part of Ephesians chapter 6, verse 4, bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. This, this, this word discipline is actually a pretty strong word. It means the same as punishment. It, it, it's, it's quite strong. It's really interesting. It's nourish them, provide for them, feed them with the punishment and instruction of the Lord. That's basically the literal translation of it. So being gentle and nourishing doesn't mean it's pleasant for the kid at, at, at any time. In fact, um, this is not on, on your screen. I don't have this. I found this a little later. Hebrews 12, 11 says, No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and a peace for those who have been trained by it. Discipline is not meant to be pleasant or, in fact, it's actually painful. And so relationship alone, if parents, your focus is on relationship, only relationship, but no rules, no guidance, no having them help them um, obey you and understand that, that's going to lead to rebellion as well, just as rules without relationship lead to rebellion too. Okay? This is how we as parents are to instruct our children to nourish them emotionally, but also train them up spiritually. And so those are a couple of things. And 
kind of going along here, but can I give you just one more tip, especially to guys? I, this is one thing I've learned of, of how to connect with your kids emotionally. This, is really, this has been really helpful for me. Validate your kids' emotions, no matter what it is. My, one of our kids' tadpole died the other the few weeks back, and it was one of their first experiences of a deep grief. In my mind, it's just a tadpole. I can get you another one, <laughs> right? But that would be completely hurting their heart. We had a funeral for the tadpole. <laughs> we did. We went out in the park, and we dug up thing. We had a funeral for the tadpole and, and, and grieved with them. Here's the thing. This applies to every relationship, especially those feelings that you do not understand the other person experiencing. The feeling is important, not the content. Okay? So when you connect with a person, your kids or whoever it is in your marriage, in the feeling level, connect with the feeling, not the content. Because have you experienced grief? Have you experienced loneliness? Have you experienced disappointment? Have you experienced anger? Yes, we have experienced the myriad of all those emotions. Your context may be different than the other person's context, but their feelings are just as real as yours. You get it? So for you as an exercise, if you're having a hard time saying, tadpole, grief, doesn't make sense. Grief, when have I grieved? What have I really hurt by? What, is, what have I mourned? Oh, yeah, I know that feeling. That's how you feel. I get it. That's how you start to connect with your kid's heart, with whatever they're going through. Because if you're like me, I don't remember my childhood as well as I should in some ways. There's a distance between there, so I don't remember what it's like being a kid. But I remember all the feelings. I remember, I remember my feelings. That's how we nourish each other in these ways. But that's not where it stops. We instruct them. We instruct them. That's not how, I, I can see you're angry right now, kiddo. You're angry, I can see that. And it's good that you're expressing your anger, but slamming the door, saying those words, yelling, that's not how we express it. How we express it, we gotta talk it out. Let's use our words. We instruct them. It's good that you're expressing your anger. It's good that you're expressing these things. It's good that you're doing those things. But here's the healthy way of doing it. If you do it in this way, there's consequences to it. And there, I'm going to bring you a consequence because that's what you're going to experience in the world. If, you, if, you, if I, daddy, went to church and I started yelling at everyone because, you know, I was angry, people are not going to like me. <laughs> okay, that's what's going to happen. So we're teaching you not to do that. And because of that, it's painful, I know. But that, this is how you do it. So next time, this is how you do it. That is teaching, training, disciplining, right? And we're going to talk a little bit more about that in, in the sessions to come. Thank you for sticking with me on this. felt like it was really helpful. This is, again, how we walk out in our family, specific practical things of being a family, husbands and wives and children that walk worthy in the manner that we have been called calling that we've received. So we'll pause there. Let's um, take this time to, to really look at some of these points that we've heard from God's Word today. Um, and I'll, I'll bring the discussion prayer points in a little bit. Let's first, let's pray. I, I want to pray for us, and as I have to pray, we can worship God with one last song. And we'll do our tithes and offerings and go end our service. Father, we thank you so much for your life-giving word and the, the places that you were able to touch our hearts on. Spirit of God, we pray for not only your conviction, but your empowerment to be able to take the steps, encourage and entrust in you that you are showing to us. God, you're not showing to us only the things that we're not doing well. But, Father, you're calling us into who we really are as your children, as saints of God, as those who've been saved by the gospel, by Jesus' finished work on the cross, and that you want us to be now shaped and conformed by that gospel. And it starts right at home. And help us in our homes, because we know that in our homes it's the hardest place. 
It's one of the most difficult places to do that. And God, we know that you know that. And we're thankful that you know that. But that all the more we need your strength, your wisdom, your spirit to lead us in those things. And we pray for a reviving, uh, a stirring, a changing, a transforming in and through us. In marriages, God, in our families, in our households, in our homes. May you do this work, Lord, for your glory and your name's sake. In Jesus we pray. Amen. Let's go into our discussion and prayer points. Here's our first discussion here. What were the unspoken rules around emotions in your home growing up? Second, what are the dangers of spiritual training without emotional nourishment? Let's talk about, let's process that as we get deeper into it. And then thirdly, as a group, together in your gatherings, in your homes, pray for conviction, repentance, and spirit-filled empowerment for families to walk worthy of the calling we have received as children, as spouses, and parents. Let's do that together as a church. And then after you finish discussion and after you pray, that will be the end of our service. God bless you. Have a wonderful, blessed rest of the week, and we'll see you next Sunday. Bye-bye.